Hi, Selwyn. <laughs> Dr. Calder, how are you? Good, good, thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, first of all, welcome. Welcome and to CWS as it is for the first time. And thank you for lending your voice to this topic, this very sensitive topic here that we must discuss. Um, but can you start off by just orienting our audience to who you are and what you do? Sure. So thank you. First, thank you for having me here as part of um, your programming on this topic. Um, I really do feel encouraged um, because I do think that the media has a very important role to play in this, uh, in prevention of suicide, especially at this critical point in Guyana, mm -hmm. in raising awareness and also in reducing stigma so that people can seek the help that they need. So I am a clinical psychologist. I'm licensed in New York. I have been working in mental health since 1994 in hospitals, um, a U.S. Uh, based army hospital uh, and outpatient clinics and with a variety of uh, presenting problems. Uh, my specialty is in post-traumatic stress, treating people who have survived childhood physical sexual abuse as well as now as an adult may have developed a alcohol or substance use disorder. I specialize in treating depression and anxiety as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, suicide is no, is nothing strange to Guyana or Guyanese. That's but right. This it became an epidemic. Yes. This escalation in numbers of deaths. When yes. were you, when did you first realize this was happening? Well, I have been keeping abreast of uh, news reports and have been aware that increasingly this has become a problem. Of course, with the publication of the World Health Organization report in 2014, that it was then, uh, you know, more widespread knowledge um, that this Guyana had been designated now as the country with the highest rate in the world. Wow. How much of your work involves uh, treating suicidal uh, patients? Over the years, a lot of my work. I, prior to graduate school, my early years in mental health, I worked with severely um, mentally ill uh, adults uh, who were suffering from severe symptoms of schizophrenia, severe symptoms of bipolar disorder, as well as a alcohol or substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And so there was constant crisis intervention um, and training around assessment of suicide. I also, um, after graduation from my doctoral program, I worked for two years uh, in a research study doing assessments uh, with adults who had attempted suicide. So this was a study looking at people who were diagnosed with depression and bipolar disorder and had also attempted suicide at least once. And for some individuals, they had attempted suicide multiple times. I also worked on a U.S. Uh, Army base hospital uh, for about a year. And for the first six months of that um, experience, uh, I was what you would call the on-call psychologist. And essentially, the job was assessing any soldier who presented at the emergency room with suicidal or homicidal uh, ideation or had verbalized those kinds of thoughts. And so my job was to assess them and make a decision about whether they needed to be hospitalized or could be returned to their commander or their unit. I see. So, so a lot of experience with assessment. I, yeah. I'm just curious about something outside of someone telling you that they're thinking about committing suicide or, or say certain things that may lead you to believe that that is possible. What are some known symptoms? Of 
known symptoms of, of a, a potential suicide victim? Um, well, you know, when you are meeting with a patient um, at every meeting, you know, as a professional, you're assessing uh, what's going on prior to your meeting. So if you had met with them one week ago, you assess what had happened in the week previous. If it's this, this is the first time you're meeting, you're assessing for, um, you know, their history and what has been going on in terms of their ability to cope with stress mm -hmm. and in terms of their current mood. And so you're looking for... Uh, levels of sadness, levels of anger, levels of rage, you're looking for loneliness, and you're also assessing for uh, protective factors um, in their lives. So that, you know, are there things protecting them from becoming stuck in these negative emotions? You, you have recommended um, four processes like education, advocacy, prevention, intervention. Yes. And recently, the, the government of Guyana um, is, is implementing an effort to either diagnose the, what is happening and to see how they can come up with some um, solutions. Yes. Is, would psychotherapy be um, highly recommended in the middle of that? Absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. But I think that, you know, more broadly, we, we want to approach this as a mental health problem. But in addition, we also want to approach this problem as a public health problem. And the power of approaching it with a public health approach is that as you're developing interventions, as you're developing education methods, advocacy measures, uh, prevention and intervention, you're also what the public health approach brings is a source of evaluating what you're doing. Um, so, you know, psychotherapy is absolutely, I believe, one of the in interventions you would use, utilize, but you want to be evaluating whether or not uh, the kinds of psychotherapy uh, that's effective in one country, whether that may also be effective in Guyana. Uh, do we need to adapt it to fit the culture? Um, these are questions that a public health approach can answer. And we also know that um, suicide attempts is a global problem, right? That about 1 million people commit suicide per year globally and about 10 million people, individuals, attempt suicide. And what we know is that the <coughs> approach um, that has been tried has been mostly clinical, but what they found is that a, 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 a clinical approach only brings moderate results. When you add a public health approach, you get a more powerful result in terms of reducing suicide rates. So, okay, you you are Guyanese, and so you, you understand the ethos of of of, of Guyana. Yes. Um, in your capacity, with all your experience and exposure yes. to this to mental health illness, yes. um, if you were to be asked by the government of Guyana to contribute to participate, mm -hmm. a would you and and b um, what are some things you would immediately want to start doing? Well, the thing I'd like to see first is, and absolutely yes um, to the first question, uh, the thing I'd like to see first is really a powerful task force that is organizing all of the stakeholders. As we know that there are people already involved in providing counseling, uh, providing services, doing education, doing advocacy work. And what, what I feel that the public as a whole is um, not getting enough information about is whether or not 
This is, um, there's a specific body that is organizing all of these efforts and identifying what all of the stakeholders are doing, uh, whether they're mental health professionals, whether they're public health professors, professionals, whether they're educators, and then trying to identify where gaps exist and then how we can fill those gaps. So that's one of the things I'd want to see uh, out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the clinical uh, realm. Uh, yes. you, you are a therapist as, as yes. well. How would you describe the role of the therapist in this? So the, the role of the therapist is really uh, providing a safe space. One of the things that happens when somebody gets really depressed and really stuck in sadness mm -hmm. and then so stuck that their thinking is constricted to the point where they're considering suicide. The role of the therapist is really to provide a safe space, a confidential space where a person can come and express what they're experiencing on an emotional level, where, where they can verbalize that sadness, where they can verbalize the loneliness, the hopelessness that they're feeling, and then use that therapeutic space to help them devise coping skills, coping strategies to first uh, become unstuck and then continue to be well. Do you, how, how challenging is it to, to counsel someone who is considering suicide? Well, it is extremely challenging. And I would say that I remember um, as a graduate student that I had a professor who taught, we were actually um, not given any sort of formal courses on suicide throughout my four years of training in graduate school. Um, I had one class on suicide. So one week of an entire semester. And that was actually only because the professor who was teaching the course, she was doing a general psychological assessment course, said that when she went on internship, one of her patients had committed suicide and she felt very anxious. She felt uh, very alone in that experience. And so she wanted to alert us as students at, of what we might be facing in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something I remembered uh, really well. And so when I had the opportunity to work on the research project, um, where essentially I was assessing patients who had attempted suicide, I was doing assessments every single day, I really felt like that experience helped me become less anxious about talking about suicide, assessing suicide, and also helping people get the help they need. Um, so, it, you know, I mean, it's very difficult when a person presents with um, suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. suicidal um, intention, and they verbalize a plan that they've been thinking about. But in the assessment world about suicide, we know that we can assess for someone who is at mild risk, someone who is at moderate risk, and someone who is at high risk. Um, so there are all kinds of questions that you can ask that will help you uh, feel more confident about the service that you can direct them to. So whether or not you could say to them, um, you know, let's work on a written contract that you will not harm yourself between now and the time you come back, or whether or not that person needs to be walked directly to the emergency room well, for what, what, immediate what, attention. What are some common misconceptions about suicides? Well, um, the number one one is that a person is weak. They're not strong enough. Um, I think that that's one major um, myth. Another, uh, I think, uh, misconception is that when people are depressed, that um, 
we should not talk about suicide or we cannot ask about suicide. What we know is that when someone is not thinking about suicide, asking them about suicide will not make them think about suicide. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another miscon misconception. Mm -hmm. But the risk you take of not asking about is, is that someone who is thinking about it or having thoughts of death, dying, wanting to be dead, you will miss uh, helping that person. In, in, in the chat room, Norka asked, uh, would a public health approach help reduce stigma in your opinion, doctor? Absolutely. Um, a public health approach will, in, in terms of prevention and intervention, would have different levels of those measures or um, guidance. So, for example, in a, with prevention efforts, a public health approach would help to guide uh, education programs about depression, about post-traumatic stress, about alcohol and substance misuse. Uh, it, it will help the, you know, specific. It would help with developing specific programs to address, for example, people in rural areas, uh, people who have experienced um, physical or sexual abuse as children. Uh, defining and developing specific education and prevention measures um, is what a public health approach will help do. And especially the part of evaluating those developments mm -hmm. or measures, yes. Let's talk, let's talk prevention. What are some do's and don'ts that come to mind when talking to someone at risk of committing suicide? Well, some do's are definitely be very open mm -hmm. um, about asking, uh, reducing your own anxiety about asking directly whether or not a person is having thoughts about debt, thoughts about dying, thoughts about um, suicide. And, you know, people, many people will also, you, you, you do is that you do want to ask exactly what the thought that they have been having was. So some people will tell you, um, I've been wanting to go to sleep and not wake up. And then you'll ask directly about whether or not they want to die or whether or not they want the pain to go away. And for most people that I've encountered when they're at that moment, for most people, they will tell you that they really want the pain to go away. The do's are also asking people about how long they've been having this thought because it helps you to identify um, what their level of risk is, whether this is a high risk in terms of have, have the thoughts been for, you know, relatively brief, fleeting thoughts lasting just seconds? Have the thoughts been lasting minutes? Have they been lasting hours, days? It's very important to know like how long the thoughts last. Um, the some don'ts are Really, you want to err on the side of caution uh, when someone verbalizes a thought about suicide. And so you don't want to dismiss it. You don't want to um, let that person go on, until you are satisfied that, they, that you have enough information from the patient's own words that you trust their word. Um, and that you've developed a plan to reduce that symptom because suicide thoughts is a symptom of emotional distress, oftentimes depression, but it could also be um, there in anxiety and post-traumatic stress as well. So in the chat room, Debbie asks, how important to evaluate the immediate danger when one recognizes a symptom? Very important. Um, 
as, as soon as somebody verbalizes that they're having these thoughts, it is very important that before they leave your site, you want to you want to ask them about their intention. You want to ask them about whether or not they have a plan. And you want to know also if they have means or access to means. So if someone says that um, they, you know, for example, with the soldiers, you know, if they at the moment had access to a gun, you would want to get that information. So if someone was stating that they're having thoughts of shooting themselves, you want to know whether or not there's a gun in the house, whether or not they have access to a gun. And uh, similarly with any kind of medication, if they are having thoughts about overdosing or taking poison, that you want to be able to ask about whether they have access, whether it's immediately accessible or, you know, uh, soon to access that. And um, Ali said, what do you tell someone who lost someone to suicide? And so this is one of the areas that has been neglected in all of this. Um, because, you know, their family members who are left behind one of the things that you do want to stress to family members, um, and I think that this is something that we don't do enough education on, that many survivors are left sad, but many survivors are also left very angry that this person uh, did not think of them, uh, took their life without thinking, and in fact, what we know from people who have attempted suicide and then have survived, we, we know that in the moment that they're having um, and they're ready to attempt, they're actually, their thought process is so constricted and so narrowly focused that they're unable to think. They, their ability to think and to make a judgment is severely restricted. And so if, they in, if in fact they were able to think about their family members or their loved ones, they actually would not attempt. Um, and so, you know, it's something that's very difficult to understand, but that's, I think, a crucial piece of information for survivors who then also need to talk about the pain of that loss, but also need to process, you know, the anger um, at the loss. Um, Debbie said, asks, do you get to the point where you want to explore the deep pain? Absolutely. Well, for, for anyone who is in long-term psychotherapy um, in treatment with me, that's what we do on a weekly basis. Uh, sometimes people who are severely depressed and are having uh, thoughts about uh, debt and dying, but don't actually have an intention or a plan to kill themselves, but are plagued by this symptom, will come two or three times a week to talk through the pain that they're experiencing. Um, so there are many people who are severely depressed and may be experiencing suicidal thoughts, but not have an intention or a plan to kill themselves. And Debbie, again, how do you distress from those sessions? Well, I consult with my colleagues, especially if there are, um, is someone I had just worked with um, had an intention or a plan. I consult with colleagues. I meditate a lot. And I listen to music, I distract myself from making sure that I have, you know, my anchors, like people that I have meaningful relationships with, I reach out to them, I talk through uh, many of the, the people I have meaningful relationships with are my colleagues as well. Um, I have a mentor that I've worked with since uh, prior to graduate school, and I often will call her and we'll talk through things. She's a therapist herself. And um, 
Norka said, kudos, doctor. CJL, my cousin should, um, should use on her son for saying, I guess they meant shouted on her son for saying he doesn't want to live. She told him he was weak. She told him he was weak. How dangerous is that? Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Um, because there's no such thing as like weak or strong when it comes to someone who's depressed. We want to think of uh, depression as a set of symptoms a person is experiencing. And that one of the symptoms is having thoughts about death, dying, wanting to be dead. So it's not definitely not a sign of weakness. We would not say that someone who has heart trouble or symptoms of heart disease as a weak person. So we really, you know, it's very dangerous to, to say that about a person experiencing suicidal uh, thoughts. As a, as, a, as a psychologist, what are some of your main concerns about this epidemic in Guyana? Um, well, specifically the, uh, the rapid increase, um, the rapid increase in the rate, but more so the unavailability uh, and the limited resources that are available for, to identify people who are experiencing depression and then providing the kind of treatment that can help them get through that process and then help them still continue to be productive. So I'm most worried that um, the infrastructure is not there, that the, I, I'm very encouraged um, at this point that, that there seems to be more of a commitment and a move towards more of a commitment, um, but it is, something that we really need to speed up in terms of we know what the problem is we do need to have in place education programs and counselors available to people because what we know is that we can identify depression when it's at a mild level when it's at a moderate level and mm -hmm. when it's at a severe level and at mild and moderate levels we can actually provide talk therapy to get people well. Um, when people are at a severe level, it oftentimes needs to take talk therapy and medication. But the, the thing I'm most worried about is the unavailability of resources for help. In the chat room, again, uh, Paula asked, how does one find you? I am in New York City. Uh, my office is on Fifth Avenue um, in Midtown. And you can find me on my website, www.talkingforwellness.com. And all of my information, contact information is there. You can email me. You can call me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, that anyone has. And um, one of the things I did for about four years is I worked as a case manager. So I'm really good with connecting people with the right uh, referral sources, even if I'm not able to help them. CJL said, a suicidal person doesn't always ask for help. How then can anyone intervene? Right. And so that's why, uh, again, going back to the public health approach, one of the things that they found is that uh, globally is that people who commit suicide often do not access <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. Do not access services even when it's available. So even in the U.S., you have people who commit suicide. About half of those people have not accessed services that are available. Um, so this is why the uh, public health approach is important so that the entire public can be alerted, can be educated about the importance of looking for signs and the importance of 
you know, keeping legislators, keeping politicians, keeping people who are in charge of budgets uh, committed to broader programs, programs that go beyond the hospital. And the chat room, Paula said, glad to hear you will go to Guyana if asked. Great. Well, I, I, I'm actually already, you know, doing what I can from here, and I'm happy to be involved in any kind of training, which I think that training is very important. I'm currently, I was invited to contribute to a mental health column on the First Lady of Guyana's website, so that's something I'm committed to. Um, I would love to be able to write more frequently, but with my schedule, I also have a young child. It's very difficult, but I am committed to continuing that. I have also joined um, the board of a local NGO that's based in Guyana, and that um, NGO is um, focused on helping children who have been sexually abused or raped. Um, so I'm committed to that as well. And I'm also committed to any long-term effort at putting together sustainable training programs for Guyana. Dr. Caldera, thank you. Thank you so much, Selwyn. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.